16, 1737 by Pope Clement XII. The St. Vincent de Paul Society, a Catholic organization dedicated to serving the poor, was established after his death in 1833. He is the patron saint of charities and horses. St. Vincent de Paul, pray for us. Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. is our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. closest call we've had, isn't it? <laughs> I get all excited, see, because, why, oh, hi, everybody. <laughs> I get excited because I come and talk to everybody before the show, because my doctor wants me to go to bed after the show. <sighs> kind of boring, but. So <laughs> anyway, here we are together. That's all that's important, you know. If we were together and we talk about Jesus, that's the ultimate. Today, tonight, I just picked out something. I don't know whether we'll stay on it long. Because it's about a wedding feast. I know nothing. I don't know anything about wedding feasts. And so I speak from a point of ignorance. However, uh, we'll see what the Lord does. You know, the, the parable of the wedding feast in Matthew, 22nd chapter, it's interesting because this uh, king, uh, his son was going to be married, and so he has a big wedding feast. I don't know about the wedding feasts in those days, but if it was an Italian wedding feast, it was big. <laughs> big. And they practically spent all their savings on a wedding feast. You better stick together, kids, if you're Italian, because <laughs> you just blew your inheritance, see? <laughs> so this was supposed to be a big, big, big wing ding. And our Lord compared it to the kingdom of heaven. And you'd say, well, why do you do that? Because we don't understand heaven. We don't even understand eternity. Nothing in this world lasts, you know. I don't know why all the buses that pilgrims get coming here all go kaput some, for some reason. <laughs> and it's always when it's hot. And, I, and the poor driver, you know, he was, what was it in the middle of the road? Something he didn't want to. He had to hit that rather than another truck, and so he hit that, and so there they are. Um, waiting two hours? No. Well, we call that a pilgrimage. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we call a pilgrimage. Because it's supposed to be hard. It really is. We're not accustomed to having hard things because, well, we have nice cars, and, and we have nice seats, and I got in a car not too long ago and felt kind of warm. And I thought, gee, it's not that warm outside, you know? 
And I was kind of jiggling her eyes. I thought, boy, this is a hot seat. <laughs> and it was. Somebody turned the heat on. <laughs> and, and it said, you know, if you're cold, you can heat your seat. I don't think that came out right either. Uh, I mean, you hit the seat, you heat the seat of the car. Then your seat gets hot. I better go on with this wedding. I have a feeling it's going to be one of those <laughs> nights. <you know? laughs> I ought to stop now while I'm ahead. You know. I, uh, anyway, we'll try to pick up where I left off. Well, he said that the whole kingdom of heaven is like a wedding feast. And he said this man sent his servants to call those who were invited. That makes sense. But they wouldn't come. Now we got to figure out what's that got to do with heaven? Well, many of us are all, we're all invited to the great wedding feasts in heaven. We're all called. But we're all going to go. Now, isn't that a shame, huh? If you're called to a wedding feast, wow. In those days, they even gave you the things to wear. You didn't have to give your clothing. And you just walked in and ate and had a good time. And so our Lord says, well, this is how it is in heaven. I have invited everybody, everybody, to come to my kingdom. Can you imagine here that it says they wouldn't come? So... The servants go and say, will you come to the king's son's wedding uh, feast? Said, no, I don't want to go. Well, will you come? You're invited. No, I don't want to go. How about you? No, I don't want to go. I'm too busy. Well, we do that today, don't we? Huh? We're too busy for Jesus. We're too busy to pray. We're too busy to go and just make a little visit to him in the Blessed Sacrament. We're all too busy. Hmm, well, let's see what happens. Well, he sent some more servants. This is a persevering king. He can't believe it. Everybody's saying no. So tell those who have been invited. Now, he's still inviting. He's still after those who were invited. And he said that I may have my banquet all prepared. I have it prepared. My oxen and fattened cattle have been slaughtered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding. Well, fattened, it didn't, don't they, I don't know. I guess they ate pigs in those days. I, I went to, the first time we put our Holy Father on the air, we put him on for 11 days. And... It was somewhere in the Carolinas, was it south or north, whatever it was. And before we started, the night before we started, they had a little pig. Well, I never ate, I never saw a little pig, let alone look at it roasting. And the little guy was about this big. And he was going round, round, round. And the odor was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> and I looked at it, poor little thing was going round. I know you keep pouring stuff on it, you know, and I thought, oh, I was getting so hungry. <laughs> it's the best meat I ever tasted. I know the pig didn't appreciate it, but <laughs> I did. So that's what he's saying. The oxen all roasted, and, and it doesn't say anything about pigs, but fattened cattle. But they weren't interested. Oh, is it that do something to your heart? They were interested. First they said no, and now they have no interest at all. 
One went off to his farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants and maltreated them and killed some of them. Oh, how ungrateful that is, you know? It is hard to imagine how ungrateful we can be. When you're too busy for God, you're too busy. You got to remember that. When you're so much involved in things that pass, they don't have anything to do with your daily life or like soap operas. Oh. <laughs> If you got time for one soap opera, you got time for God. If you got time to walk your dog, you got time for God. I'm not against dogs. So please don't write me any letters. Say, why don't you like dogs? I know dogs have to go. I wouldn't want you to walk in front of my house, but if they got to go, they got to go. It's a necessary condition when you have a dog. You can't tell them when, where, or how. They know. So, what do you do? You walk your dog. And I bet you walk your dog more than he needs to be walked. But you could pray. You can pray while you walk your dog. You can tell Jesus you love him. You can pray for poor sinners. You can pray for all those who don't go to the wedding feast. And we have a wedding feast every morning when you go to Mass. Are you sure you don't have time to go to Mass in the morning? Oh, it's too cold. Well, it's better than where it's too hot. <laughs> right? It's too cold. Well, what do you want? You want the Lord to come with a, a heated blanket like they do in the hospital. They, you're going to have an operation. They put you in these freezing, freezing operating rooms. And I feel sorry for the doctors, you know. The, I don't know how they hold anything. You just, bleh. And then they come put a hot blanket on. You just came out of a, what do you call these little ovens? Well, they try to warm you up, but your nose is frozen by that time. <laughs> and if he asks you which leg they're going to operate on, you don't know. <laughs> so, I mean, we have a reason for everything in this world. Everything. But there's no reason, really, not to visit the Lord and not to pray. That's why you were created by God, see, to go to this wedding feast. And not only did they say no, not only were they not interested, they maltreated their servants and killed them. You say, well, I never killed anybody. Are you sure? I said, yes, I'm sure. I've never killed anybody. Are you sure? Have you killed them by Verbal abuse, telling somebody how dumb they are. Well, even if they're not, they're going to be. The more you tell them. Are you sure? Are you sure you haven't stolen the faith away from someone by telling them something that wasn't true? Have you diluted the gospel and diluted the, the doctrines of the church and, and maybe made somebody lose their faith? Well, you see, it's worse to kill the soul than the body. Worse because you take away faith from somebody, that's pretty bad. First of all, you don't know if they'll get it back, you see. And then you don't know what their life's going to be like without faith. Wouldn't it be hard not to have faith, huh? Wouldn't it be impossible if you couldn't go into a church and just talk to Jesus about your about your problems. And see, when these people killed <clears throat> these men, these servants, and then insulted the king, they were stealing away from the king his whole kingdom. 
you can go and you say, are you going there? No, I'm not going to go. Why? I don't like it. Okay, I won't go either. You ever do that? You know, we all do that. We're, we just copy everybody. We don't have original ideas. Are you going to the game? Nah, they're not going to win. <laughs> well, they probably won't if somebody don't cheer them on. <laughs> you need encouragement. I never was successful at football games. Uh, I always rooted for whoever made a touchdown. <laughs> and see, I was a drum majorette. You can't imagine that, can you? <laughs> you can't? No? I can't either right now. <laughs> but I was. I was the only one they had. That's why it was probably there. <laughs> And I would, stand, I would stand there, you know, I had to bring the band out, and then I had to bring him back, and, and I did all that at halftime. But I never understood the game, because everybody's running in opposite directions, and I never know who was who. <laughs> but whoever touched the ground at that point, I went, yay! <laughs> they look at me and say, well, you shut up, for goodness sake, that's the other team. <laughs> But I thought that was wonderful he made it. <laughs> you got all those men after you with all those helmets and them. They have to look down there like they came from Mars. And if you fall, let me tell you about falling with that ball in your hand. I never understood that either. They all pile on top of you. <laughs> I watched them. They just go, pound, pound, pound. And this little guy one time, I thought, well, at least he can't make the top of it. But he did. He started running way over there. And <laughs> the guy's down. Why you got to suffocate? <laughs> Why don't you just take the ball away? No place he can go. I mean, I never... Does anybody understand that? You all understand that? You do, huh? I'm glad somebody does. Because I, I never understood the principle... He's not going anywhere. It's a wonder he can breathe. There must be a thousand pounds on top of that poor guy. It's like a punishment for catching the ball. <laughs> and I, I never understood the game. Now why did they say that? It has nothing to do with this wedding feast. <laughs> yeah, it does. Because we put a lot of time and effort and the strange thing about these football, they're always in the winter, it's snowing. You would not go out the door if it was snowing to go to Mass. I'll make a bet. Oh, it's cold. It's slippery. But you're sitting on that uncomfortable bench for hours, eating stale hot dogs, cold hot dogs and drinking something from a little flask. <laughs> and I don't think it's hot tea. <laughs> well, if you do that, I would imagine for 45 minutes, you won't know who's playing who. <laughs> But you're keeping warm, right? Well, I think you, well, I wouldn't want you to bring a little flask to Mass, though. That would not be good. I think you could bundle up, though, and go to Mass. See, I don't think that's, I think that's what our Lord doesn't understand, no more than this king. I mean, this was a free meal, and all you wanted to eat just to celebrate a wedding. And, and there was no reason to do this. To say, there's no reason for you to miss Mass because it's cold. <laughs> well, my friends, uh, there is a hot place. <laughs> and once, if you ever get down there, there's no coming back. See? Well, you see, you may not have gone to hell for not going to Mass. It's not 
whether you went to Mass, it's a matter of indifference. See, I don't want to go. I, I'm not grateful. I don't want to be there where Jesus was always and is always there. See. The Father has an awesome uh, attribute. He has many attributes. And the one I admire the most is that everything is now. There is no past, no future with God. Everything is now. So when you go to Mass and I go to Mass, I am at Calvary now. There's a beautiful Negro spiritual that say, were you there when they crucified my Lord? What a beautiful song. Well, you can be there every, every, every man. See. Now, see, I don't think when you die, our Lord's going to understand that you had all the ambition and all the gumption to go to a football game with your little flask and not the mass. See, that he's not going to understand that. No more than this king understood. So now the king was furious. Mm. He was furious. And what did he say? He dispatched his troops now. Oh, hey, we're in trouble. First it was his servants, now his troops. He destroyed the murderers and burned their town. Oy, ay, ay, ay. Mm. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready. But as those who were invited proved unworthy, go to the crossroads in the town and invite everybody you can find. Isn't that wonderful? That's the rest of us, you bunch of sinners out there. <laughs> sinners. He's waiting for you. I think that's encouraging. The hitch in it is you got to stop thinning. See, that's the hitch. But is it? Oh, yeah. It shouldn't be. You know you're miserable. You know you're miserable. One time I was working with this man years and years ago. Uh, he, was, he was pretty bad. So he came to see me one day, and he said to me, you look kind of sad. And I said, I am. Oh, he said, can I help you? I said, no. Why not? Because I said, I'm sad over you. Me? I'm fine. No, you're not. And I said, I was thinking this morning that I will not see you in the kingdom. And I'm very sad over that. Well, if you're going to be there, I'll be there. She says, no, you won't. Because if you don't stop what you're doing, and I've been working on you a couple of years now, and I can't work anymore because I'm wasting my time, and you're getting more hard and sin, and so I feel bad about that, and I feel bad that God has this wonderful place for you, a joy and happiness, you're not going to go. So I said to him, I said, I think you better leave. Huh? You're not listening to what I'm saying. You better go. Well, he turned as white as a sheet, and he left. But he came back a week later. He said, I, he said, you mean heaven is for me after all I've done? I said, yeah. All you need is one confession. It's free. The wedding feast is free. You feel like a new man. He said, you mean I can go to heaven then? I don't know if God's going to take you then, but you're at least you're ready. Well, he went. It was years and years, and he went to confession. And he's been straight ever since. 
but we don't understand what we're forfeiting. That's what's right. We don't know what we forfeit. Little Jacinta <coughs> from Fatima, the, the children were seeing hell while the, while the people were, and seeing the, the Holy Family, while the people were watching the sun coming down. And Jacinta was so upset because she said people don't know where they're going to go. And she made every kind of sacrifice, every kind. Because we don't know. And we you know what she used to say a lot? <clears throat> she said, oh, sweet Mother Mary, why don't you show everybody hell? Then nobody will go there. Well, I don't know. Because these people were invited twice <coughs> to a free banquet. And those banquets last seven days. <laughs> Boy, you could get wound up by that time. <laughs> but see, they won't go. There's somebody out there who won't go. Don't you think it's kind of foolish that you can be happy forever and ever, never ending? See, we don't even understand that. We don't understand what heaven is like. It's absolute, total joy. And it's, there's nothing to take it away from you. I, I met somebody the other day, and I, I said, how are you doing? He said, oh, I'm wonderful, but I know what's going to happen. I said, what? I'll feel miserable sometime this week. I said, how do you know that? Because <laughs> it always happens, you know. Our Lord warns me ahead of time by giving me some joy, and then clunk, something happens to me. Oh, what a terrible way to think of God. You see, that's not true. God wants you to be happy in this world and the next. Does that mean you're not going to suffer? No, you're not kidding yourself. Getting out of bed is a pain. Don't you think it's a pain, the older you get? Huh? You don't jump out of bed anymore. I was told when I was a young postulant this many years ago, <clears throat> when you get up, when you wake up, get out of that bed like there was a fire. It took me a while to, to do that. I remember the first morning in my religious life, I woke up and I thought of what I was told. You know, get out of that bed like a fire. And I went, Whew, I just put it out. <laughs> oh, dear Lord. I also remember the morning I really determined I was going to get up, and it was cold, really cold. And um, I put, we, we used to have a little, uh, oh, I guess like these old-fashioned jars, not jars, but basins. Huh? <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> you had to put your water in it the night before. And it was on the floor on top of a piece of paper. Then when you got up in the morning, you wash your face in this basin, kneeling. And so I finally got myself kneeling, and I put the washcloth on. I just stood on top. <laughs> I stood there. I really woke up, you know. I, I thought our Lord was telling me how to walk on the water or something, you know. I, so I'm looking at this washcloth, and I'm looking at it, and I picked it up, it was dry. I put it back, it just sat there. And it had frozen during the night. <laughs> so I thought, where's the fire, Lord? <laughs> so I had to crack it up and put it in gingerly, and I was like, I, I, one of these kids on, um, you're on Candid Camera, do y'all remember that? And they had a, a, about four or five young boys, little guys, 
in front of a mirror, and their mother told them to wash up. And so they were in front of them, and they put two fingers in the water, and it went like this. <laughs> well, that's what I did that morning. <laughs> I wasn't clean, but I felt better. You know? <laughs> but see, all these little things, and it's a little thing, you know, a little thing, uh, are just so aggravating. They're, they're not big things. But do you know, they pile up, see? They pile up. And it changes your heart. Because the more we can say yes to God, no matter how hard it is, the more He says yes to us, see? Because we love him more than we love ourselves. And this king here now is asking for all of us, and this is what he says. Now they collected everyone they could find, bad and good alike. Now, <laughs> all of you haven't been in confession for years. Better go. The wedding feast is ready. Mm. The wedding feast is ready. Go. Get that garment on you. The garment of holiness, the garment of sanctifying grace, the garment of being clean inside. Really clean. Nobody can be in a state of sin, real serious sin, and be, feel clean inside. We can't. You may say so, but it's all a lie. It's not true. It's all a lie. Because that little, remember we talked about conscience not too long ago? You know, it's going to come up. Now you take another drink, and that might help a little bit, but don't help at all. Because when you finally wake up, oh, now you've got a headache, your conscience is bothering you, you feel guilty, miserable. You see, our Lord is saying here, you have to say yes. Now, we've had all the good and the bad in this wedding. And what does the king say? He goes out and says, go out again. So the servants went on the roads and collected together everybody they could find. Now here's the problem. When the king came in to look at the guests, he noticed one man was not wearing a wedding garment. Now you say, well, what's bad about it? You got the bad, you got the poor, you got the rich, you're all coming, you're too poor to buy a wedding garment. Uh-uh. The host provided the wedding garment. All you had to do was put it on. That's all you had to do. So the Lord went to the king and said, Hey, why don't you have a wedding garment? The man was silent. And the king said, Bind him hand and foot and throw him out in the dark, where there will be what? Weeping gnashing of teeth. For many a call and few are chosen. Now what does that mean? Does that mean our Lord calls you and then changes his mind? No, 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 no. Hmm. That man without the wedding garment refused to be clothed with a brand new suit. That's like confession. You refuse to be renewed. You refuse for this new garment of grace, this new look. You know, it's a wonderful thing about confession. You may be old, bald, or half blind, you could be. I have all these wrinkles on you and you feel young, but you're old. <laughs> I don't care how you feel. 
One look in the mirror. First thing in the morning. You're old. Now, you can do what you want to make yourself look better, but you don't. You don't look better. You look old. <laughs> if you're old, you're old. <laughs> you can't change it. There's nothing worse than an old gal with a miniskirt, I can tell you. <laughs> Pitiful. <laughs> if I had legs like that, I'd put a barrel around them. <laughs> I mean, you, j <laughs> you just can't do it over. That's all. It's not going to work. See? It's just be old and enjoy being old. You're supposed to be wise when you're old, but you're acting stupid. Now you can dye your hair. The roots show. <laughs> if you got black hair and you dye it blonde, that's fine. I don't object to anybody dyeing any hair, that's fine. But if you're 95, <laughs> not going to work. <laughs> Everybody knows the truth. See, we know the truth. So, no matter how old you are, act like it and look like it because that's what you are. And when you die, though, see, that's the beautiful part of all of this is <sighs> when you die, it's all changed. You're in a state of grace. You're young. You're young. You're you're young because that's how your soul is. Your soul doesn't get old. Never gets old. It's always there. It's always present. It's always young. That's why you feel young, but your bones don't move. See? I mean, <laughs> isn't that true? You feel you feel like you always felt when you were 12, 14, 18, 20, 25. 30, 40, 50, that's your soul is young, and you're trying to keep up with it. You can't. <laughs> Until the resurrection, that old body is going down. But that's okay. That's where wisdom shows. A happy old person is almost majestic. They shine because they're happy with how they look and how God made them. See, you're answering the call. <laughs> you're answering the call. See, because it's the soul that matters, not the body. Not the body. <laughs> I had two sisters we transferred to our crypt at the temple. One was dead 18 years, the other 16 years. I said to the undertaker, I said, could we change the habit? He said, no. There's nothing there. And I thought, yeah, that's right. There's nothing there. A few bones, a little dust. But the soul is still there. And that's the whole challenge of life. The challenge of life is not how young you can make yourself look. The challenge of life is how beautiful is your soul as your body grows older. That's the challenge. How close to God are you? Because your soul is immortal. It's going to live forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. We don't even know what it means. The soul is gone. When you die, we had, I told you like a week or so ago about this wonderful tape I heard about this man who died uh, on the operating table. And he said he, he rose. He knew he was on that operating table. And he rose and he stood behind himself. And uh, he, his body was there in the doctors. You could see him work, but he forgot who he was, who it was. 
He walks around. This is his soul. And he's looking down and he says, that's me. I'm dead. You sure were, buddy. Sure was. But see, that soul was the same soul that God put in his little body at conception. See, Now, you can abort a baby and build the body, but you can't kill that soul. That soul is there. You can't. You see, the soul is what's so important. And the body is a temple. When you go up to see the new temple, it's beautifully constructed. Everything inside is hand carved by little guys, talented, who carve with a few tools that don't seem like much when you see them on a table, but in the hand of a master, they do wonderful things. And your soul in the hand of God is awesome, awesome. In the hands of the world, it's ugly. In the hands of the enemy, Satan, it's disgusting, miserable, miserable. So it depends. It's never going to go away. It's never going to dissolve. It's, it's not going to be just blown up in the air. When you die, it's immediate. Your soul leaves your body. That's why you're dead. And now what? See, that's the whole problem. I wish, I wish I could get it to you. The soul is gone. When that body dies, it's gone. Now, you could have a body in a casket, but that's just a body. The soul is, has met its creator and been judged. We call that particular judgment. And you're happy if you go to purgatory because you want to be seeing God. Oh, you're so sorry. You want to do anything you can to make your soul beautiful so it can face God face to face. See? And see, we spend so waste, waste so much time in this world trying to make everything right. And, you know, we, we do everything to make us look better. Well, that's fine. I don't want anybody to look miserable. But I, I think we ought to spend some time on our soul. Okay. Keeping it clean, away from grievous sin, going to confession often, often, often. But they how often? Well, I go once a week. So what do you say? A lot. Since I've been in television and on television, it's gotten bigger. <laughs> but I am sorry, and he knows that. And he forgives readily and quickly. See? We have a call. Hello? Hello, Mother. Hey, how are you? Um, I've been better, but um, I want to thank you for taking my call and thank you for your guidance over the years, and that's one of the reasons I called in. Uh, my name's Debbie. I'm from New Orleans. Uh -huh. And um, you were speaking before about how God wants us to be happy here on earth. Yes. And I've read that in the scriptures, and I understand that, and I understand he wants us to have his peace. But over the last seven years, my entire family, and we are very devout Catholics, we have been beset by one major tragedy after another, yeah. uh, including uh, the death of my very young husband, um, almost losing my mother, my sister's husband leaving her with non-support. I mean, I could go on and on, but the yeah. bottom line is this. And we pray. We pray constantly. And we, we have not lost faith in God. But what I don't understand, and I guess because St. Bernadette was my confirmation saint, and I know a lot about her, is I know Mary said to her that some of us, you know, that she could not have happiness in this world. Do you, do you have any, any feelings or does the Holy Spirit guide you in any way to give me an answer that, that maybe 
uh, is this a test? Is this something that we just have to go through to show our love for God? I mean, what is what what are your insights on that? What Our Lady said to Saint Bernadette is, "I do not promise you happiness in this life, only the next. Happiness in the world is a happening." It's a happening, and it goes. The Lord never promises happiness. In no translation of the scriptures do you ever read, I give you happiness. I give you joy. Joy. And joy does, is not a feeling. Happiness is a, is a feeling. Joy is a deep awareness, a deep awareness that you are loved by God. And that nothing happens to you that is not for your good. And so that takes away the anguish, the doubt, and the anger of saying, you know, what am I? It's always something else happening to me. But you see, if we understood our soul, if we understood that it is our portion to suffer. What did our Lord do except to love us and his love guide him crucified? But what saved us? What is it that gave us the ability to die and to enter the kingdom? His love. But he did get on top of a mountain and say, I love you, I love you, I love you. No, he got on a cross. He got on a cross and he stretched out his hands, was nailed to that cross and said, I thirst. For what? For water? No. For your love. Crosses in any form, any form, physical, mental, spiritual, are good signs. You say, oh, tell me that one now. No, it's true. Padre Pio said if we knew the value of the cross, we would covet it. Well, I see too many people doing that. They're not. These trials also can be a test for your family. He said to Peter, you know, how much do you love me? Do you love me more than these? And Peter was, before he said, yeah, all these will deny you, I will not. But it took a cross and humility to tell Peter, yes, Lord, I love you. Then our Lord said again, do you love me more than these? He would say, yeah. He said, you know I love you. And every cross we have brings us closer to the Lord. Why? It detaches us. It makes us aware we do not have here a lasting city. I don't know about you, but I am appalled at how fast time is going. It seemed like yesterday was January 1st, and it's the middle of September. And, and you say, well, why are we going so fast, Lord? It's fast. You say, life is fast. At every cross you have, say, thank you, Jesus. Do we understand it? No. Do, does it feel good? No. But maybe our dear Lord wants you to pray for poor sinners. When times are good, it's easy to have faith. It's in the cross that our faith is proven. Our Lord said one time about forgiveness and love, he said, if you only love those who love you, do not the pagans do this? Hmm. And so I would suggest that sometimes when it just seems too heavy and you can't seem to carry it again anymore, go somewhere in a church where the Blessed Sacrament is, or just in your living room if you can travel, say, Lord, 
I thirst for your love, for your understanding. Give me strength, give me courage. You can't look at Our Lady, that awesome woman, the greatest creature ever made by God. No one will ever equal her or even come close. Suffered all her life for the redemption of mankind. She suffered with her son. You got to suffer with her son. And so do I. He doesn't ask us to understand. He says, take your cross upon yourself and I will help you with it. Learn of me. And we have to have humility. Admit, I don't know why I get over this and that happened, and I get over that and this happened. It's okay. You're pleasing to God. And you know what else? He trusts you. We don't often think of God trusting us. And when we have crosses and more crosses on top of that, he trusts me. I have to think he trusts me. He says, Angelica, I think you can carry this. It's for sinners. It's for the poor, it's for priests, it's for religious, it's God knows what or who. Okay, look, we can do it together. We can do it together. And think of the soul. So your soul is being more and more purified and made beautiful before God. See, that's awesome. Everybody wants to be beautiful. But you know, some of the people I thought were the most beautiful were not beautiful physically, but spiritually. There's a little note here that says a, a father is contemplating suicide because his son just died. Don't do that. Don't do that. You may never see your son again. It's in life that you will see your son again. It's in life that you will feel his presence again. It's in living. It's in living that you will understand why he died. It's in living, not dead. And you know, we need to persevere in these situations. We don't know what kind of a situation is coming up, do we? Hmm? I'm a great believer in the things to come. <laughs> Most people don't want to think about them, but they're covered. You read the Old Testament, and God let his people go for a long time. You know, and all of a sudden, the lid popped off. Everything changes. Our Lord loves us. The Father loves us. He wants to see his son in everyone and everywhere. He's going to do it somehow. We'll all have pain and suffering. We always do, you know. Our life is filled with it. I'm so grateful I walk. Our Lady healed me. I have other aches and pains. I'm getting old. You know, I wake up and this arm won't go all the way. And I put my both feet on the floor. They're walking, but they don't want to start. <laughs> That's the problem. If I could just wind them up like the old cars, you know, and just wind it up. And sometimes I get a little grumpy over it, you know. Could I? I used to walk so fast that, uh, and I walk. I'm grateful for every step I take. But the young ones in my community are way ahead of me. <laughs> and I either have to call them back or they look at me and say, oh, we better wait. And they do that. They're very kind, very thoughtful. Uh, I don't care. I'm me, and I'm this age, and I'm not getting younger. And I don't mind everybody waiting on me. I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs>
these uh, people who spray at your houses for bugs, you know, they're always around because we live in a farm and there's more bugs than I ever thought existed. And they're all on our farm. And so they come in and they spray and it smells like terrible. It's awful, awful. And, and they try to spray around me and before me and after me. And, and so today they decided to bring my dinner in my room because the odor was so bad. And I enjoyed it. I don't care. I give them a chance to be holy by waiting on me. <laughs> All right? So if they go an extra mile, they're getting the merit. I'm getting the goodness. <laughs> I would like you to know that God loves you infinitely. He wants you to enjoy that banquet forever and ever and ever. He wants you close to him so you could have that joy. It's awesome. That no one can take away. So hang in there. Be faithful to the church, to our Holy Father and imitate Jesus. And I'll see you tomorrow night. Bye now. To order this episode of Mother Angelica Live Classics from the EWTN Religious Catalog web store, log on to EWTNRC.com 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, or call 1-800-854-6316. Coming up, stay tuned for Women of Grace with Johnette Williams, next on EWTN. I'm Jerry Usher. And I'm Debbie Giorgiani. On our radio show, Take Two with Jerry and Debbie, our audience often brings us their concerns. And the number one prayer intention we hear is for loved ones to return to the church. Both Debbie and I have personal experience with this issue, so we decided to address it in Trustful Surrender, Stories of Grace Amidst Crisis. This book is filled with the real situations people have faced, including the good, the bad, and the ugly. And each one offers meaningful insights and advice for concerned parents and grandparents. We hope this book lifts you up. And offers you comfort and hope. Trustful Surrender, Stories of Grace Amidst Crisis by Debbie Giorgiani and Jerry Usher. The latest release from EWTN Publishing. Now available at EWTNRC.com or call 1-800-854-6316. As the global pandemic and civil unrest spread fear and anxiety, let us look to the Blessed Mother's intercession for healing, reconciliation, and peace. Join us as we hold steadfast in our daily petitions to Jesus through Mary for an end to this plague and for unity throughout the world. Pray with us the Holy Rosary and devotions with the Franciscan missionaries of the Eternal Word every day after the live daily Mass on EWTN. In our most desperate hour, we turn to you, O Lord, in joining with the prayers of the Franciscan Missionaries of the Eternal Word. At Our Lady of the Angels Chapel, we ask for your blessing and consolation for all who are afflicted by coronavirus. 
during Sunday Vespers with Benediction. Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern on EWTN.